Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional grade industrial supplies. Count on real time product availability and fast delivery. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. It's Saturday, the 9th of March. I'm Kira Evans, and this was a week that saw smoke and mirrors over the budget, German embarrassment over leaks, Joe Biden and Donald Trump ready for a rematch, and big wins, the Brits for Ray. Grab a cup of something hot, put up your feet, and get up to speed on the seven biggest stories of the week. This is the standout seven from the small seven. It's news, but not the news. This week saw the spring budget on Wednesday and that led to a week of speculation and leaks as the Tories hope to improve their position before a possible general election. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt was out and about talking up his long-term plan for the economy and warning that any tax cuts would have to be matched by cuts in public spending. So we do want to move to a lower taxed economy, but we're only going to do so in a way that is responsible. Uh, but if we can spend money on public services more efficiently then uh, that will mean less pressure on taxpayers. Despite rumours of riots behind the scenes, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was all smiles as he visited a former Honda factory in Swindon, which is due to become a logistics hub. Sunak said the budget would be prudent and responsible and that the focus is getting the economy on the right track. One of the measures that has been floated is a change of rules on the so-called non-DOM tax arrangements, something that's been a long-standing Labour policy. Labour's Liz Kendall said even if the Chancellor does borrow Labour's policies, it still won't be enough to turn the economy around. Nothing that Jeremy Hunt announces in the budget will undo 14 years of economic failure under this Conservative government. The big question around the budget was whether or not this would be the last roll of the dice for the government before an election is declared and Labour shadow paymaster general Jonathan Ashworth said that whatever happens in the budget, it won't fix the economy and undo 14 years of Tory rule. Working people want change and I think that's why actually there's going to be a May general election. And I'm challenging Rishi Sunak today to name the date of that May general election. The general view, though, is that Rishi still hopes to get the Rwanda bill through Parliament and start flights before he sets an election date. And Minister for Trade Policy Greg Hand said Labour have troubles of their own in the wake of George Galloway's Rochdale victory. Keir Starmer's not able to run the Labour Party. This is a person who wants to run the country, but he can't even run his own party competently. He's not got rid of the anti-Semitism that we saw during the Corbyn years. He's not taken effective action. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt popped in to meet King Charles on Tuesday as concern was growing about potential steep spending cuts in public services after the budget. With many councils already struggling to make ends meet and 55% of the British public in favour of more spending on public services, it may seem like a bad idea. Councillor Sean Davies, chair of the Local Government Association, says that the pressure on local councils is already immense and more cost cutting will lead to real difficulties. We are doing a lot more with a lot less and and that is not sustainable going forward. We've seen 19 councils this year approach the government for exceptional financial uh, assistance. This is bigger uh, than one uh, financial settlement. This is a systematic issue that the government need to address. But even with Birmingham and Nottingham councils already having to drastically slash budgets, former Home Secretary Priti Patel had little sympathy. This government has to show its commitment to reducing the size of the state, which has kept growing. Currently, public spending is over £1.2 trillion. Pounds. That is unsustainable. Wednesday saw Chancellor Jeremy Hunt's second official budget, which claimed to reduce taxes, but actually increased the tax burden on households. A 2p reduction in national National insurance plus an increase in child benefit and a continued freeze on fuel duty all looked like good news. However, despite a theoretical £14 billion giveaway, the tax burden remains at the highest level since 1948. Chancellor Hunt worked in a few jokes as tradition demands, including a reference to his own sweary education secretary, Gillian Keegan. His dig at Keir Starmer, though, landed somewhat awkwardly. I know he's been taking advice from Lord Mandelson, who rather uncharitably (laughs) said he needed to shed a few pounds 
pounds. Ordinary families will shed more than a few pounds if that lot get in. The biggest change in tax rules came with the scrapping of the so-called non-dom tax rules, something Mrs Sunak used to take advantage of. Taxing non-doms has been a long-time Labour policy and Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer was none too impressed by Hunt borrowing it. Take the desperate move after years of resistance to finally accept Labour's argument on the non-dom tax regime. Has there ever been a more obvious example of a government that is totally bereft of ideas? The budget was followed by a veritable whirlwind of political spinning. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt was on Morning TV on Thursday talking about his plan to end national insurance and abolish what he called an unfair double tax. But it wasn't clear how exactly that would work in practice, raising questions about whether the Tory party were floating an unfunded £46 billion tax cut, which would alarm economists and, according to Labour, would be worse than the disastrous Liz Truss mini-budget. Rishi Sunak had no detailed answers either on the national insurance question, but was keen to reassure potential voters that the economy was on track. The direction of travel is now crystal clear. Our plans are working because of the improvement in the economic environment. We've been able to start cutting people's taxes responsibly. Labour shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves, who saw her non-dom tax plan nicked by Chancellor Hunt, was unimpressed. Well, it is an utter humiliation for the government and I will now undertake the task of going through all of the government documents to make sure that we can honour those commitments because I will ensure that everything in Labour's manifesto is fully costed and that pledge has not changed. That was the sound of mourners gathering in Moscow for the funeral of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who died in prison last month. Thousands of Russians defied the Kremlin's orders to attend the memorial and pay their respects to the late leader. And even on Sunday, when cemetery gates were closed, crowds still gathered, demanding to be let in. Here's one mourner explaining the difference between Navalny and Russian President Putin. Someone wrote that this man sacrificed himself to save the country, and the other one sacrificed the country to save himself. Alexei's name will go down in history. When they saw Britain urging Germany to go ahead with a proposed supply of long-distance Taurus missiles, the missiles, which have a 300-mile range, could be used to strike key targets, including the Kerch Bridge and occupied Crimea, but Germany has been reluctant to approve the shipment. Matters were complicated by Russia's publishing of a top-secret call between officers of Germany's Luftwaffe, who discussed in great detail how countries like the UK and France were shipping cruise missiles and other long-range munitions to Ukraine. The leak revealed that British forces might also be on the ground in the Ukraine, something that Downing Street says was already known. Former Defence Committee Chair Tobias Elwood said that while the leak is embarrassing for Germany, it's not necessarily dangerous. Given the intensity of Russia's spying uh, on Germany and others, they probably have not learnt anything that they didn't already guess uh, already, but that doesn't prevent some serious conversations taking place uh, in the corridors, diplomatic corridors between Germany and Britain and indeed NATO as well as to why this happened in the first place. Wednesday saw Russia come close to causing a major diplomatic incident as Ukrainian President Zelensky and Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mistotakis were very nearly struck by a missile in Odessa. They'd been hosting a press conference in the port city after Russian drone attacks had killed several people. But during the event, another missile hit about 200 metres away, killing several more. Meanwhile, the UK has been trying to crank up pressure on European allies, floating the idea of loaning frozen Russian assets to Ukraine on the basis that they would be awarded as war reparations eventually, but German ambassador to the UK, Miguel Berger, was still urging caution as Germany reels from a military conference call which was intercepted and leaked by Russia. Currently, the big focus should be on ammunition. That is what Ukraine really needs. But the Chancellor wants to be sure that whatever we do, there is no escalation which could lead then to consequences we all don't want to see. Thursday saw Ukrainian President Zelensky announce a new role for his former commander-in-chief, Valery Valusny. He's going to be appointed as Ukraine's ambassador to the UK, a prestigious job, but also one that will keep a perceived rival out of Ukraine. Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron was in Berlin on Thursday, meeting with his German counterpart, Annalena Bayerbach, in an attempt to encourage the Germans to step up weapons supplies for Ukraine, despite the embarrassment over the leaked call. Thursday also saw NATO get reinforcements as the previously neutral Swedes joined the alliance, bringing it its number to 32 countries. Swedish PM of Kristersson says it's the change in policy that reflects the seriousness of the threat Europe is facing. 
Russia will stay a serious threat to the Euro-Atlantic security for the foreseeable future. It was in this light that Sweden applied to join the NATO Defence Alliance to gain security, but also to provide security. Donald Trump had a rare legal victory on Monday. He's been winning plenty of Republican primaries. And this week saw Super Tuesday, which could see him lock up the Republican presidential nomination with plenty of time to spare. But legal wins have been harder to come by. However, Monday saw a unanimous Supreme Court judgment in Donald's favour as the nine justices overturned the state of Colorado's attempts to throw Trump off the ballot on the grounds that he was responsible for an insurrection on January 6th. Trump celebrated the result, praising the court for a well-crafted and important decision. Decision. But as MSNBC legal analyst Andrew Wiseman pointed out, the court hasn't cleared Donald on the charge of insurrection. It doesn't take on and say that Donald Trump did not engage in insurrection. Mm-hmm. In other words, the issue of the facts, did, is he an insurrectionist or not? was not before the court. They're simply deciding this as a legal basis. Tuesday saw 16 states and one territory go to the polls to select their nominees for November's presidential election. Things largely went to plan for the two leading candidates. Joe Biden won comfortably everywhere except the tiny territory of American Samoa. Donald Trump also won almost all of the contests on the Republican side but lost in Vermont, which means his only real rival, Nikki Haley, is now the first woman to have won two Republican presidential primaries. Biden described Trump's campaign as one of revenge and retribution in his victory statement, while Trump continued to double down on his mixture of anti-immigrant rhetoric and projection. People say, a lot of experts have said the stock market's the only thing that's doing well, and that's doing well because our poll numbers are so much higher than Joe Biden's. He's the worst president in the history of our country. Donald Trump's week got better on Wednesday as his last remaining opponent in the race for the Republican nomination dropped out of the race. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley's win in Vermont on Tuesday wasn't enough to keep her campaign alive. She officially suspended her campaign, called on Donald to earn the support of her voters and stopped short of endorsing him. I am filled with the gratitude for the outpouring of support we've received from all across our great country. But the time has now come to suspend my campaign. I have no regrets. Thursday evening saw US President Joe Biden address both House of Congress and the annual State of the Union speech. His speech came as Donald Trump looks certain to be the Republican nominee following the withdrawal of Nikki Haley and the world awaits a rematch between the 2020 elder statesmen. The speech saw Joe fired up, hitting out at Trump over his remarks on NATO, calling on action on the border and Ukraine from Republicans and standing up strongly for abortion rights. He closed by outlining the stark difference between himself and his opponent. The issue facing our nation isn't how old we are, it's how old are our ideas. Hate, anger, revenge, retribution are the oldest of ideas. But you can't lead America with ancient ideas that only take us back. You lead America, the land of possibilities, you need a vision for the future and what can and should be done. This week saw intense diplomatic efforts to secure ceasefire in Gaza before the Muslim holy month of Ramadan begins on Sunday. It started with US Vice President Kamala Harris issuing the strongest of statements on Israel's behaviour in Gaza. Harris was speaking at Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, where civil rights protesters were badly beaten by Alabama State Police 59 years ago. She called the conditions in Gaza inhumane and said that Israel must open new border crossings, allow aid to get in and restore basic services for those living in Gaza. And in what was a clear message to Israel, Israel and Hamas, who are negotiating a peace deal, she called for an immediate six-week ceasefire to get aid in. This would allow us to build something more enduring, to ensure Israel is secure, and to respect the right of the Palestinian people to dignity, freedom, and self-determination. But despite increased US pressure, there was no sign of progress towards a ceasefire in Gaza on Tuesday as talks in Cairo broke down. Israel hasn't seen any representatives, but despite urging from US President Biden, Hamas hasn't made any further steps on the release of hostages. Meanwhile, US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met with Qatari Prime Minister Sheikh Mohammed Al Tahani and called on the Houthi rebels to stop their attacks in the Red Sea. If the Houthis care at all about their own standing, their own reputation, the way in which they're seen by the world, they will stop these attacks and stop the terrible damage that it's doing. 
uh, to people in the region, people in Yemen, people around the world. With the U.S. growing increasingly frustrated and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu refusing to give up on the idea of Israel's next offensive in Rafa, fractures in the U.S.-Israeli relationships seem to be growing. U.S. President Biden took the extremely unusual step of using his State of the Union address to announce a new initiative to accelerate the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza. I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. No U.S. boots will be on the ground. A temporary pier will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance getting into Gaza every day. Still to come on the stand at seven, the science minister makes a miscalculation and Ray wins big at the Brits. Right after this. Join us today during the Jeep Celebration event. Right now, get 20% below MSRP for an average of 15178 under MSRP on the purchase of a 2023 Jeep Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe or Summit 4xe. Not compatible with lease offers or with any other consumer and set of offers. 15178 average based on 20% below average MSRP from all 2023 Grand Cherokee Overland 4xe and Summit 4xe models in dealer stock. Residency restrictions apply. Take retail delivery from dealer stock by 4-1. Jeep is a registered trademark. Welcome back. It's been almost a week since the senior Tory figure found themselves in hot water, but I guess they've been busy with a budget. That all changed on Thursday, though, as it emerged the UK's Science Secretary, Michelle Donnellan, has had to pay damages to an academic for suggesting that she and another academic supported Hamas. The confusion apparently arose because Donnellan misunderstood a tweet from Professor Kate Sang and wrote a letter to UK Research and Innovation calling for Sang's removal from an expert panel. The settlement of £15,000 was paid by the Department of Science. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer says taxpayers must be astonished at how the government operates. Totally insulting. We need a change. I'll tell you something else. If we're privileged enough to come into power and have a Labour government, we will never allow that sort of thing to happen. That will be history. There have been calls for Donnellan to be sacked, but Rishi was still backing her on Thursday on the basis that the department's legal advice had been to go ahead with a defamatory letter. Leader of the House, Penny Mordaunt, was at the podium, trying her best to put a positive spin on matters. When the Honourable Lady was entitled to redundancy payments from uh, being a Secretary of State, she did not take that and handed it back to the department. And I think that speaks volumes about the Honourable Lady's character. Last Saturday saw some of Britain's biggest pop icons take to the red carpet outside the O2 Arena for the 44th annual Brit Awards. This year's winners include Connie Minogue, who scooped up the Global Icon Award, Dua Lipa, who was named Best Pop Act, and indie rock band The Last Dinner Party, who won the Rising Star Award. And it was a history-making night for R&B star Ray, who won a record-breaking six awards, including Artist of the Year, Song of the Year, and Album of the Year. She had some words of advice after her win. It's cheesy, it sounds obvious but don't you dare stop chasing after your dreams mate because if I did I wouldn't be standing here right now you know don't give up don't give up what is happening right now There was sad news last weekend as it was confirmed legendary interior and fashion designer Iris Apfel passed away at the incredible age of 102. Born in New York in 1921, Iris got a start as a copywriter for Women's Wear Daily and also worked as an assistant for interior designer Eleanor Johnson and illustrator Robert Goodman. It wasn't until 2005, at the age of 84, that Iris found fame in her own right after her personal clothing collection became the subject of a Met Museum exhibition. From from there, she rose to stardom, becoming the oldest cover star in history for Dave's magazine and signing with IMG Modeling Agency at 97 years old. She passed away peacefully at her home in Palm Beach, Florida on Friday. Rest in peace, Iris. I don't think much about age. It just happens. I'm lucky to be there to capture it. The sense of humor is absolutely necessary. I don't mean a ha-ha sense of humor, but I... I mean, being able to look at all the silly little things and how foolish they are and how many important things we really don't pay enough attention to. You've been listening to The Smart 7. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m. Hit that follow button and have a great day.
Give us seven minutes, and we'll give you the world. As a major research institution, Arizona State University offers the most online bachelor's degree programs, along with world-class faculty and dedicated support. Discover why ASU is ranked number one in innovation for nine consecutive years. Tap to learn more.